Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have uh, covered uh, compressible flows in fair uh, detail, the basics of them and also applications of them uh, and we have gone through both uh, integral or control volume kind of approaches and then uh, differential uh, equation kind of approaches and we had uh, a fair uh, amount of uh, uh, understanding of compressible flows. We know what are shocks what are expansion fans and uh, so on. So, but now we can look at some specific uh, topics, some uh, special topics uh, where uh, few things go beyond what we have learnt in uh, a normal course of gas dynamics and uh, introduce you to such uh, topics which are also topics of uh, research. And uh, uh, then if further on you are interested in those topics, you can uh, learn more, okay. So, the first uh, uh, topic that we would like to look at is um, hypersonic flows. So, we know what is uh, subsonic flow, the definition is Mach numbers should be less than 1. We know what is supersonic flow, uh, definition for that is Mach numbers should be greater than 1. Uh, what is hypersonic flow? What is so special about hypersonic flow? Uh, so hypersonic flows are also uh, flows with high Mach numbers that is Mach number is greater than 1, but they are of much much higher uh, Mach numbers um, than uh, moderate Mach numbers like 1, 2 or 3. Uh, generally what is considered is Mach numbers greater than 5 that is a general uh, description that Mach number greater than 5 uh, can be considered as uh, hypersonic flow, mm, okay. But uh, really there is no uh, hard and fast uh, rule that uh, this is the exact uh, demarcation between supersonic flow and uh, hypersonic flow. Uh, hypersonic flows are important uh, in uh, several cases, um, especially for uh, cases involving uh, travel to space and uh, return and uh, so on. But even nowadays people are also looking at uh, hypersonic flows at uh, lower altitudes, okay. Usually uh, when a spacecraft goes into orbit or for example, we had many such uh, missions uh, where they go into orbit and come back. The orbital velocity is approximately 8 km per second and you return back. An example is given here of the Apollo missions that uh, the US had carried out uh, there at an altitude of 53 kilometers. the velocity was 11 km per second speed of sound at that altitude is 338 meter per second. So, if you calculate Mach number, it is a very large number 32.5. The Mach numbers of this uh, nature are often uh, encountered uh, during uh, re-entry, but we also have to ask uh, the proper questions whether uh, uh, we can actually define what a proper Mach number he is at these particular uh, conditions because there are many things that happen in a uh, hypersonic uh, flow, okay. So, similarly if you consider other planetary atmospheres uh, for example, the Galileo probe to uh, Jupiter that also uh, the entry Mach number was around uh, 28, okay. So, that is in a different uh, planet. So, in general, if you consider these uh, kind of missions, uh, they will have very, very high uh, Mach number. 
now, uh, can we then describe things only on the basis of uh, Mach number is something that we have to understand. Uh, Mach number in general if you look it is actually it relates um, uh, how uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the flow is uh, related to uh, the internal energy of the flow itself. So, as Mach numbers increase uh, very quickly we find that uh, the kinetic energy contained in the flow can be as high as the enthalpy of the flow itself. Now, in that case if such a flow uh, which has very high kinetic energy is uh, made to um, slow down ok, the, if it is made to slow down which will happen when uh, a body enters uh, atmosphere at very high Mach numbers then on the surface of the body uh, the flow has to match uh, the uh, body's velocities or it has to come to a relative stop at the body or it has to come to stagnation then all that kinetic energy will be converted into heat energy then the amount of heat that it produces is so uh, high the temperatures can become extremely high something of the orders of 5000 Kelvin or uh, 10000 Kelvin. Uh, so, it can be very very high mm, and that means uh, that uh, such bodies at their uh, noses can uh, uh, face very high temperatures and uh, significant heating. Uh, so, uh, what we find then is that what we call as hypersonic flow is not only just a, uh, about Mach numbers. There are some things which happen different in hypersonic flow. There are some physical flow features or some flow physics that enter uh, that we generally do not consider in a supersonic uh, flow. Okay. Uh, though there is heating in supersonic flows uh, that heating is relatively insignificant when you compare it to uh, cases where Mach number is very high like 38, 25 and so on. In such hypersonic flow cases always we have to protect the vehicle thermal protection system is uh, important and it uh, plays a dominant role in deciding what is the weight of the vehicle how much payload it can carry and all such things. So, examples uh, of such uh, these are uh, taken from uh, what is available in websites or on the uh, open web. So, one is a uh, case of some re-entry of some uh, uh, capsule it can be containing humans or uh, some experimental capsules as they enter the earth's atmosphere uh, they undergo significant heating which is also shown over here. Um, the other case is that of uh, uh, different uh, novel applications that people are looking at one is uh, looking at a very high uh, uh, speed cruise vehicles that can be uh, looking at uh, traveling across the globe in, in short durations or the other one can be uh, uh, using uh, single uh, uh, now normally if you consider any uh, rockets uh, they actually carry both the oxygen and the fuel within themselves and uh, they go up and usually it is consumed uh, the rocket is also not uh, readily recovered though nowadays there are technologies to recover uh, the launch vehicles. Uh, but uh, people have been thinking of uh, situations where they can develop vehicles which can be reused again and again in that case such vehicles will uh, go through uh, hypersonic flows as they go out into space and come back. Now, if you look just take a look at how these vehicles are for example, here you have a, a typical research vehicle um, which is uh, supersonic in uh, nature ok. Its Mach numbers are significant, but not very high and if you look at the uh, way they are designed they all have sharp surfaces. 
uh, they have good um, uh, the materials but still made of uh, titanium and such uh, high temperature materials. Uh, but essentially sleek body with uh, thin uh, wings. But if you look at another example which is uh, many of you would be fa familiar it is the space shuttle. Uh, this is also uh, this has similar structures to uh, the previous example but you look at the shapes they are all rounded they are all blunt and there is a significant black portion underneath which is all uh, thermal protection. This goes through uh, severe heating as it re enters the earth's atmosphere and uh, also significant is that most of the sections are blunt it is not sharp. So, just the design of vehicles uh, that fly in hypersonic regime and supersonic regime they are completely uh, different. So, what are these additional uh, flow features uh, that uh, come into picture in hypersonic flow. So, uh, just by saying that Mach number is greater than 5 it is not enough uh, to uh, describe uh, hypersonic flows and a majority of these uh, descriptions is described very well in the textbook by uh, Anderson on hypersonic and high temperature uh, gas dynamics uh, and uh, these descriptions are uh, mainly taken from that uh, particular uh, textbook. Okay. So, if you consider uh, for example, a, a very thin wedge of angle 15 degree and uh, very high Mach number say Mach 36 what we were considering earlier. Uh, just consider for uh, the sake that the gas is a perfect gas and gamma is 1.4 we find that the angle of the oblique shock that this wedge makes is 18 degrees. Now, the angle of the wedge itself is 15 degrees and the shock wave is at 18 degrees it is not very far away from the body. So, that uh, means that uh, the shock is very very close to the body and across the shock uh, there is a sudden jump in uh, pressure, temperature, density and so on. Very high temperatures can be encountered in this uh, uh, small region between the shock and the body. And uh, if temperatures go very high then uh, high temperature effects come into picture uh, where the air that we know as a mixture of uh, nitrogen, oxygen um, mainly and other species like CO2, argon and so on, uh, but mainly nitrogen and oxygen as molecules. Uh, it uh, does not remain as this particular mixture anymore rather it undergoes uh, several chemical reactions at higher and higher uh, temperatures. So, um, you find that there are uh, high temperature effects that come into uh, picture at these high uh, speeds and that happens very close to the wall. That means, now uh, heat transfer into the wall becomes uh, very uh, important. So, one basic character of uh, uh, hypersonic flows is that uh, shocks are located very close to the uh, body and sometimes it is called as a shock layer ok thin uh, shock layer ok. So, shock uh, located very close to the body is one characteristic of hypersonic flows. The other characteristic is that uh, generally uh, the hypersonic uh, vehicles uh, they are uh, ha they have blunt shapes their noses are made rounded they are not at all uh, sharp. Uh, as a consequence the shock that develops um, around such bodies is also uh, it is a detached shock a bow shock ok. We had discussed uh, this kind of a, a shock in the context of Crocos theorem much earlier where we uh, said that um, the bow shock is a region where uh, there is lot of uh, gradients of entropy. Uh, as a consequence the flow that occurs around the bow shock is not irrotational, it is uh, rotational because of uh, entropy gradients. 
this is because you have a curved shock and uh, as the shock curvature is different at different points um, it has different strengths at those points therefore different entropies for streamlines that pass through uh, the shock therefore an entropy gradient uh, develops now a, a normal um, approach that is done um, usually that is carried out for the analysis of uh, these kind of uh, uh, vehicles or any aerodynamic analysis is to split uh, the flow field into uh, parts where uh, we do not have to consider viscous effects so the inviscid part and the part very close to the body uh, where we say that viscous effects are important which is the boundary layer. Okay. So, uh, that is the boundary layer. So, here you have the boundary layer, okay. this is the boundary layer where viscous effects are important and uh, the general understanding is that in the uh, inviscid region uh, you have um, and um, the flow is irrotational. Uh, but if you consider such kind of uh, blunt bodies then you have a layer uh, which comes from the curved shock where there is entropy gradients and as a consequence uh, there is rotational flow and uh, this washes over the body actually and uh, therefore now it becomes uh, difficult to uh, say where is that uh, rotational flow where is the boundary layer and so on and uh, doing this calculation becomes very difficult and uh, therefore, uh, this particular layer where there is significant entropy is known as the entropy layer. Okay. Uh, so, uh, these become significant in uh, hypersonic flows. So, uh, doing the traditional analytical approach, a uh, traditional analysis approach of uh, a rotational flow then a boundary layer uh, has to be revisited carefully. The other uh, problem that occurs uh, or the other uh, thing that occurs in hypersonic flow uh, is that uh, now the huge kinetic energy it gets uh, transformed into uh, internal energy close to the walls uh, that is uh, uh, due to viscous uh, dissipation also. Okay. So, when that means uh, um, the temperature near the ball will increase significantly. Uh, when temperature increases uh, uh, correspondingly uh, density decreases and uh, uh, therefore, uh, what you get is that uh, in order to pass the same mass flow rate okay, um, you need much much uh, higher thickness or uh, thickness is required it becomes much higher. So, we are talking uh, of flows very close to the wall. So, we are talking about viscous effects and the boundary layer that means this boundary layer thickness must be quite um, large in hypersonic flows is significantly larger than at moderate Mach numbers and it goes as um, um, the Mach number square by square root of Reynolds number. So, when Mach number increases uh, significantly, uh, boundary layer thicknesses increase significantly. Now, what is the consequence? Now, for the flow, uh, what it really sees is if there is certain body here and the flow actually sees uh, a body and there is a small very thin boundary layer around the body and we say that uh, the flow uh, outside the boundary layer is inviscid, uh, inviscid. So, if we can solve the inviscid part for the outer flow then that imposes a pressure field over the body due to which we can calculate the uh, pressure forces on the body. Uh, but in hypersonic flow uh, the same case the boundary layers become very thick they become very thick as a consequence the inviscid flow outside gets uh, deflected by much larger margins um, than uh, what is uh, normally found in thin uh, boundary layers. 
So, this affects the inviscid flow and as a consequence the pressure distribution gets affected. So, this um, means that uh, viscous effects on the boundary is affecting uh, the inviscid flow also and it affects the uh, surface pressure distribution. Hence, uh, calculating uh, lift uh, and drag they have to be done very carefully. And usually these hypersonic flows occur at uh, very high altitudes uh, as we have seen like 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers. Uh, at such high altitudes the density is also very low. Then one has to carefully consider this uh, part about continuum is something that we had discussed uh, very early on uh, when we were discussing uh, the thermodynamics in the context of gas dynamics. Now we really see where th those uh, topics come into picture. Uh, the, uh, uh, the whether continuum actually applies or not has to be evaluated by looking at a Knudsen number carefully. So, when we do analysis of hypersonic flows always it is good uh, practice to um, calculate Knudsen number first and then uh, uh, find out whether we can continue with compressible Navier-Stokes equation or uh, we have to use other equations like the Boltzmann's equation and so on. Okay, so, th those are also a part of uh, looking at hypersonic flows and as has been now uh, sort of um, mentioned often um, the uh, hypersonic flow is a flow where uh, temperatures become very high uh, due to conversion of uh, kinetic energy to uh, the internal energy of the gas. So, when temperatures become very high um, then uh, the nature of the gas itself can change. So, when temperatures are as high as 11000 Kelvin taken uh, by considering a calorically perfect gas it can be bizarre numbers like 11000 Kelvin or uh, 20000 Kelvin and so on. Uh, but uh, one has to carefully consider at this particular point because um, uh, calorically perfect gas assumption no longer holds, holds good. It may be chemically reacting flow, it may be ionized flow uh, therefore, uh, energy interactions will be very important and uh, the energy equation itself has to be reconsidered. There may be additional modes of heat transfer that may become important like uh, radiation. Uh, so, not only just uh, uh, convective heat transfer, uh, convective heat transfer itself is quite large and uh, this convective heat transfer is actually inversely uh, uh, proportional to the uh, radius that is if you have blunt bodies with large radii of curvature they have lower convective heat transfer. That is why sharp corners are not preferred in hypersonic flows otherwise they can simply uh, melt away always uh, rounded or blunt corners are preferred. So, this is the reason why space shuttle is very rounded compared to any uh, supersonic uh, flights. Okay. Uh, so, uh, high temperature effects become important in uh, uh, hypersonic flow. So, in all if you consider uh, a body in hypersonic flow then there are several aspects to it. One thing is shocks become very close to the body. Uh, then the other one is that you have uh, very high temperatures. So, high temperature effects like chemical reactions, non-equilibrium flow and so on become important. And uh, you have uh, a very strong interaction of the viscous effects with the inviscid flow and also the entropy layers become important. So, all in all if you look at uh, uh, the um, hypersonic flow there are several physical features of this kind which is important which we normally do not consider in uh, supersonic flow. So, when such effects become start dominating the flow field then 
it is termed as hypersonic flow. Generally, a Mach number greater than 5 is a good uh, ballpark point to say that the flow has become hypersonic and um, you can start considering these effects. Uh, but uh, even at lower Mach numbers, if there are chemical reactions and so on happening, then some of the aspects of hypersonic flow may become important even at uh, lower Mach numbers. Okay, so, this uh, gives a very uh, general uh, introduction to um, hypersonic flow, what uh, physical flow features become important in hypersonic flow. And we see that there are lot more complexities involved in hypersonic flows than supersonic flows. But uh, hypersonic flows also provide some uh, kind of uh, simplification which you cannot do in uh, supersonic flows uh, precisely because of uh, thin shock layers and so on. Uh, the, uh, they provide some uh, kind of uh, uh, approaches like there are uh, the uh, coefficients or non dimensional uh, numbers become independent of Mach number which is known as Mach number independence. And this can be demonstrated just by looking at the oblique shock equations. And another useful uh, way of analyzing um, uh, hypersonic flows or forces in hypersonic flows is by considering what uh, Isaac Newton had uh, remarked much much uh, earlier uh, before all these became important uh, about forces on uh, bodies uh, over which flows impact. Okay, so, that is an impact method and uh, it is also called uh, Newtonian method uh, and surprisingly in uh, hypersonic flows uh, these techniques work well which are quite simple. They are based on only the local inclination of the surface and uh, nothing else. So, we will see some of these uh, uh, sort of simple uh, methods to look at hypersonic flow in the uh, next class. Mm. So, uh, what we really need to understand in hypersonic flows is that uh, there are several flow features uh, which are uh, become dominant and they become different uh, compared to supersonic flows. Uh, therefore, if you are looking at hypersonic uh, uh, bodies in hypersonic flow, uh, their shapes the way they are designed are completely different from the way uh, bodies in supersonic flows are uh, designed. Okay. Uh, so, we will uh, close this class now. Thank you.